What kind of a show are you guys putting on here today? You're not interested in art? No. Well, look, we're going to do this thing. We're going to have a conversation. From Chicago, this is Film Spotting. I'm Josh Larson. And I'm Adam Kempinar. This is for all those memories that belong in the back of the mind. Like this penalty one. It's weighing on her, so let's lighten the load. A one-way expressway to... We're not going to think about that right now. Woo! Speaking of memories, the general public seems to have remembered the existence of movie theaters, making Inside Out 2 a massive hit at the box office. But is it among our best of the year? This week, it's our top five films of 2024 so far. Joining us, Michael Phillips from the Chicago Tribune. I totally forgot Michael was coming. Joy must have grabbed that memory for some reason. It's all ahead on Film Spotting. Welcome to Film Spotting. It's our best of the year so far this week, Josh. First thing to establish, everyone loves ground rules. What is a 2024 movie anyway? Oh, no. Michael Phillips, welcome to the show, and please give us your 2024 film eligibility criteria. <laughs> uh, I saw it in 2024. It. So even even if it's a, uh, like I saw the big broadcast of 1938 for the second time, and I, I, I'm even considering, <laughs> that's even, the, yeah, I, I consider that eligible. Can't okay. wait for We're, Citizen Kane at number one. This is going to be great. <laughs> We're very loose with the rules here on Film Spotting. We are thrilled, as always, to have Michael Phillips back on Film Spotting. Later in the show, a 2024 film that didn't crack our top fives, but it's new in theaters. So we're going to talk about it. Josh, we have had a chance to see Janet Planet, the feature directing debut from playwright Annie Baker. will also reflect on the passing of the great Donald Sutherland. Michael, this is simple. No consensus, no outliers. We each get five picks, our five favorite films of the year so far, and we're just going to count them down. Rotate old school film spotting here. You get to start with your number five. Number five. I got twelve. What are you talking about? I got. I went. <laughs> I did actually. It was. A, it was darn hard to come come down to you know like the actual five. But you know we'll see. I, it's I, been I love a good this. year so far. I love the midway perch midway through the year because like you can just pretend it never happened. Come you know early December and uh, exactly. <laughs> we actually think. erase this show. We just erase it. It <laughs> yeah. doesn't go into the archives. It never happened. Let's rethink the whole thing. Well, my number five is a film I just saw a, a couple of weeks ago, and and that's a that's a nice that's a nice how do you do for for June, and uh, it's a it's a film called Tuesday, Dina O. Pusick's feature debut, and uh, it's not the only feature debut uh, that that it's, that rose to the top for me. And uh, Julia Louis Dreyfus, really really excellent uh, as um, this mother who's uh, coping not very well with the imminent death of her daughter. A teenager played by Lola Pettigrew, um, and right away in the first five minutes, less uh, you you understand the fantastical parameters of the story. Uh, it's beyond magical realism. Just like okay, take it or leave it right away. It's not magical realism to me. Sort of implies a more or less realistic story with like surprise elements later on of magic. And this is you know you're gonna you're gonna get a large shape shifting size shifting talking macaw that is basically death and then angel of death and that and that's that's the third character in this in this film tuesday and uh i haven't been so sucked into anything all year that quickly and assuredly by especially by a brand new filmmaker uh this croatian director really wonderful uh i don't know i i'm i'm really still thinking about it you know i saw it i knew mm -hmm. about 11 people would see it in the country I'm one of them. Um, I, you guys are, I think, also. So that's that's eight of us. Eight, yes. eight of the eleven. Big fans. Uh, big fans. Big fan. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, absolutely. And um, I, I'm 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 really really happy to have uh, just seen it come into existence. Uh, uh, and I think honestly, that's where the future of cinema is: is spending up roughly that amount of money, taking that degree of a chance, which is somebody who's proven herself a lot in short films, uh, just as a visual stylist working with tip-top uh, performers who just simply trust a visionary. And uh, I don't want to overstate it uh, because it is, you know, it's a certain size of film, but I'm, I'm really hot for Tuesday. So, yeah, number five. Yeah, we talked about this last week, Michael, on the show. We're both big fans, and you mentioned it's a debut. 
I think we're going to see a, a theme here, possibly among our three lists of some really stirring debuts. And that's why we gave Tuesday the Golden Brick Nod on our last show, you know, the annual award we have for exciting work from emerging filmmakers that may not get a large audience. And so we wanted to get behind Tuesday right away, just off my top five. However, I've got it. Wow. If I'm looking at a top 10, which I feel really good about at this point in the year, honestly, I think it's like at about seven. So it was close. Enjoyed Tuesday quite a bit. So my number five, speaking of Golden Bricks, you love to see a Golden Brick nominee from the past come through with their follow-up. And that's exactly what Jane Schoenbrunn did with I Saw the TV Glow, which comes on the heels of 2022's We're All Going to the World's Fair, which did get that brick nod. TV Glow follows a middle school boy and a high school girl, They're those ages when we first meet them in the film. They form this unlikely bond over the deep lore of this cheapo sci-fi series that's called The Pink Opaque. And then from there, they grow older and reality and this show and TV in general, they begin to blur in ways that are very open to viewer interpretation. And this is all guided by Schoenbrunn's increasingly adept eye for images that are very distressing, I think you can say, but also many of them have this welcoming weirdness. And that was my experience of I Saw the TV Glow. Now, there's been an interesting debate that I've caught up with uh, since the film came out, and there's been a lot of pieces written about it and podcasts about it, a debate about what critics owe in terms of those interpretations of a movie like this, especially as they relate, in this case, in TV Glow, as a metaphor for the trans experience. So questions like, do critics have a responsibility to acknowledge and explore all possible interpretations in in their wrestling with a work? Are they only responsible to express their own interpretation? Is one interpretation the right one? Or maybe we should say the more correct one, at least. I don't know if I have answers to any of that, but I was especially intrigued by the conversation our friends had on the Next Picture Show podcast um, about I Saw the TV Glow. They had guest critic Emily St. James on for that discussion, and it was really good. It got my mind spinning, not just about the movie, but about the role of criticism in responding to a movie like this. So check that show out. It was part of their pairing with Donnie Darko, which was also a really good conversation. And if you still need to see I Saw the TV Glow, you can rent it right now on a lot of places, Amazon, Apple TV, Google Play, Microsoft, something called Spectrum, I found, and also Vudu and YouTube. So yeah, catch up with this one for sure if for some reason uh, you didn't see it in theaters. I don't know how big of a release it actually got. Well, now it's my turn to say that that's a movie that was just outside my top five, right in the mix there at number seven or eight for me, Josh. And I don't know the answers to those heady philosophical critical questions either. I do know going back to our review that that interpretation was the only one I had while watching it. And it was the lens through which the movie made sense to me. I do still need to hear that conversation though over on the next picture show. The way I looked at this is trying to come up with a sort of framing device, I suppose, for my list. And it's pretty simple. I've got five films that stand out because they take big swings. And I'm going to start with the one that features several hundred or more actual swings, not a directing debut in this case. It's Challengers from Luca Guadagnino. I love Justin Chang's line, Challengers comes at you like an amped up Adidas sponsored jewels and gym. I think that gives you a pretty good sense of of Guadagnino's pluck as a director, though credit certainly has to go as well to the writer, Justin Koritsky's big swing number one. This is a highly sexually charged movie, and more than that, it's a movie that arguably is about sex as much as it is about tennis. But do we see any actual fornicating between its three sexy stars? Only fits and starts, because all the mental and physical work of sex is happening between these three people on the court. The climax, as it were, confounded some, I know, in its form and in its failure to deliver a more traditional sports movie payoff what does pay off and i i appreciated that about it let's be clear but what does pay off for me as well the non-linear structure that makes every stroke on the court matter more and sometimes take on different meanings based on what we've just learned it's the year's better showcase of zendaya's talents and it's not even close 
it's the year's better showcase of Mike Feist talents, and that's because he just has a very little part in Jeff Nichols, the bike riders. And I'm certainly ready to get more familiar with Josh O'Connor now. We got an email from a listener named Rachel who said, the door I would walk through without a doubt, Josh O'Connor, and what Rachel's referencing there, Michael, is on our show during our review of Challengers. I think Josh posed to me a question based on now having seen this film, and I appreciated Zendaya in a way maybe I hadn't in some of her previous performances. Josh asked me, if I'm walking into a theater and all it says above the theater door is the name of those three actors, which one am I walking into? Just just based on performance or or actor, don't know anything else about the movie. Rachel says, it's Josh O'Connor. Yeah. I first noticed him in God's Own Country, Wow, and then just this year in La Chimera, which I greatly enjoyed. Dare I suggest he brings Daniel Day-Lewis to mind? I encourage you to check out both. So that's from Rachel. A big swing there from Rachel to say that, but you know what? He clearly has the chops. And that's just based on Challengers, and I still need to see those other two films, unfortunately. So Challengers is my number five. This is clearly the year for uh, risky Daniel Day-Lewis uh, comparisons, because I love the Glenn Powell's character in Hitman. Is okay, Daniel Day, and I, he's called out for this. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. he's still the benchmark, you know. But, yeah, uh, well, that's great. Well, I have more to say about Challengers when I get to. I might as well. I might as well. Though, Adam, you do deserve bonus points for getting the word fornicating in there. I yeah, always appreciate welcome. it. Nice work. Uh-huh. <laughs> All right. Michael Phillips, your number four film of the year. The number four is a film that I saw uh, just uh, the fall of the previous year, last year. We Grown Now. I saw that on the festival circuit. Um, this is uh, Minhal Beg's really, really tender, lovely, and, and quite beautiful 1992 story set in the Cabrini Green Projects in Chicago, uh, and it's a it tells a just a, kind of a simple story of these two young boys, ten year old Malik and his friend and high rise neighbor Eric. This mattress is heavy. You're still not gonna give us a hand, are you? Nah, no, I'm good. Does Mama know you're jumping? Mama wants you tell her. And what if I do? Gosh, go away, D. Let me jump. Uh, why? So you can get hurt and start crying to mom? You're so mean! Look, you're about to cry right now, aren't you? That's not true! Ugh. You don't gotta be like that to your sister. Not everybody can jump. Not like me. It's really just a, a kind of a kind of an episodic structure of a tale that just kind of gets them through the days and the months together uh, at a time of great change and not particularly happy change for Cabrini Green and that the cops are you know, knuckling down. There's been a, sh a fatal shooting uh, based on real life violence in Chicago. And I don't know, I, this film, I, I saw it twice. I sort of understood why some people thought it was a little idealized or kind of honeyed. Um, it's, a, it's a bit soft in terms of its depiction to some about, about the harsh realities of life uh, for these kids. Uh, but I, I just found it, you know, there's, there's such a thing in the world and in these cinematic medium called poetic realism. And I don't think we've scratched the surface about what poetic realism can mean, depending on who's imagining it. And uh, with the writer director of the talent of bag, I think it, to me, it felt uh, absolutely earned and justified and you know, even even when you get to things that are direct homages, uh, references to other Chicago movies, uh, when the two boys play hooky, run downtown, run around to the train station, and, and end up at the Art Institute, uh, and you're getting you know sort of <laughs> echoes of Ferris Bueller. Um, you're getting a little bit of Cooley High in there, maybe more to the mm -hmm. point. Uh, uh, the filmmaker uh, Bag is referenced. Uh, Crooklyn, Spike Lee's Crooklyn, in terms of uh, how do we make it real but not really real in in, in its sort of day to day vibe uh, and visual imagining of a world. I found it really rich, uh, just a rich experience both times. And to me, We Grow Now was a really heartening extension of the talent. She she was not fully on display in her previous film Hala, uh, which is actually her third feature. But uh, yeah, I I just hope. Uh, I uh, hope we get m more of the same, and, and we know it'll be different because those two films, although inspired by events in her own life and just sort of echoes of her own family issues, she's she's really got uh, versatility in her corner too. So, yep, yeah, I'm hot for this film. 
We Grown Now, another one that's gotten the golden brick nod from the show, Michael. And uh, yeah, I I get what has been said about that honeyed element that you referenced. My experience of this movie, you know, growing up in the Chicago suburbs, my perception of Cabrini Green Homes was all from the local news, which was just completely alarmist and emphasis it was hysterical essentially in depicting this community and so being able to see something that recognized the humanity and the daily life of these families there is something i appreciated and i think it it is you referenced it in some of that synopsis it's is acknowledging the difficulties of living in cabrini green as well but it also does offer this corrective this really artful balance that i at least appreciated. So yeah, good one of the one of the good ones from 2024 so far. All right, number 4, you guys ready to do this? Furiosa, a Mad Max saga. I I got to <laughs> I got to catch up with you two after your your review while I was traveling, but I mm-hmm. I'm not going to hold you to task too much because, you know, you guys didn't dismiss the movie entirely. You had many appreciative things to say about it. So you're riding um, in high. So that, so I can hear it coming. That's good. That's good. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I was just riding high on this film. Absolutely. And maybe part of it was that I've seen, I swear, every review on Letterboxd that has passed my feed says, it's no Fury Road. And maybe I fell for this so hard because I went in just tossing that out the window. It it was, I didn't even think of that as a possibility. It wasn't a standard I expected this movie to at all meet. So that opened up the freedom a little bit. And I do have to say that I loved it in conjunct, because it was a prequel to Fury Road, precisely that reason. Uh, I, I think it's a prequel that almost feels necessary because it further enriches for me one of the things that was so brilliant about Fury Road. And this is the sense of hope that Charlize Theron's Furiosa has in that film, even in the face of real horrors. That's the trajectory of her character, her story. It, it's what sets her apart from, obviously, Immortan Joe, but it also sets her apart from Max, who's this Darwinian survivalist, right? Furiosa is something different. And here... In her own movie, we get to see the desperation and the despair from which that hope was eventually born. This is an incredibly dark movie. It's full of dismemberment and and torture, even on the part of our supposed heroine. And I just think that was incredibly brave to not make a a spunky movie about, you know, this, this young girl who's got a lot of grit. But instead, this is a movie that goes deeply into the perversity of vengeance and and suggests maybe that Furiosa had to fall this far in order to become the Furiosa we see in Fury Road, one who does choose life over more death, which is the driving prerogative of this wasteland that she finds herself in. So I thought Furiosa was incredibly moving, very mature on that front. Uh, it was also another action movie masterclass uh, on its own. And you know, Tom Burke's Praetorian Jack, this this greaser Elvis in the wasteland was so much fun. And I do have to differ with you guys about Chris Hemsworth. I don't think he worked for either of you. I thought he was this delirious, delightful presence. Um, he was kind of the circus ringleader of this gang, but also without realizing it. I mean, Hemsworth realized this, but Dementis didn't. He was the circus clown, too. And I thought that performance worked brilliantly and offered a little of a balance to all that darkness I'm talking about while also being very much a part of it. You know, that it's, it comes down to Dementis, Dementis's fate and what he thinks about vengeance too. So anyway, I could go on and on about this. It just really worked for me. Um, it is still in theaters. If for some reason people haven't seen it, I know this has not been the blockbuster that many expected or that inside out Two has been. So, so it is well worth seeing in the theater. That's where you got to see it in the theater and you still can. The darkest of angels. The question is... Do you have it in you to make it epic? Yeah, it's, just to be clear, Josh, okay, I think you're mischaracterizing my Chris Hemsworth issue. I, I actually don't think it's in the performance. My issues aren't really with the performance, really more with the writing and the pacing, and that's Same. not really him. Okay. Uh, so I the think talkiness? That, was it the talkiness? Uh, that- yeah, the scenes, uh, uncharacteristically for Miller, I think, uh, stall a little bit visually when he's taking over 
you know a, mm. a good chunk of the of the of the script here and there. So uh, that's that's my issue. I, I think you're willfully mis. I think you're willfully actually mischaracterizing these <laughs> opinions. So. <laughs> well, it's it's been it's been a while, Michael, and I was listening to it, um, you know, on on a transatlantic flight, short on sleep. So maybe I misremembered. <laughs> but I do think to your point about the script, I I do that conversation Furiosa and Dementis have at the climax, I I love everything they say, yet I still wish they said it in half the lines somehow. <laughs> somehow. I, I do think it works and it's crucial and it's needed, but it does get a little talky. And so I can see what you're saying for that scene in particular. And it's funny, that scene in particular, which obviously we can't really get into here, is one of the reasons I maybe have some misgivings about the film or I should say, I'm not as enthusiastic about it as you, Josh. Some of those themes and different ideas that you're talking about that it sounds like you feel culminate there in that scene. To me, that scene felt gratuitous and it it didn't pay off for me the way it clearly did for you and, and probably the way Miller intends. So that would be one of my uh, concerns there with Furiosa. But I knew it would make your list and it's certainly not it's certainly not one of the the lesser films of the year, it it deserves to be in this conversation, even if it didn't really come that close to my top five. I think I've got it. I've got it maybe at 11 or 12 so far this year. Let's talk about a movie I like more. And it's one that you, Michael, have already espoused the virtues of my number four film of the year so far is Tuesday. Big swing here. Gosh, I don't know. <laughs> Death appearing in the form of a talking macaw, <laughs> as you described. Arinze Kenny voicing Death. Oh, the best, With, the best. As far as I understand it, so you good. know, no, no real effects assistance, making Death not this smirking, ethereal enigma, but another tragic figure caught in this circumstance with the mother who, you said this well, Michael, who is resistant to her terminally ill daughter being taken from her as we all would be. And if that wasn't bold enough, you know, it's, it's mostly a fairy tale ish chamber play, right? It's confined to these characters right. and the home that the mother and daughter share until the decision. One of the characters makes leads to consequences that range outside of just their little realm. I'm not totally sure as we touched on Josh, the movie can, carry the weight of the questions it provokes with that decision. But I believed the character revelations that it generates and lots of movies and other great pieces of art have dealt with mortality and how we as human beings confront it or try to deny it. I don't know that there's anything brand new to say any grand new lesson to take away or knowledge to be gained that hasn't already been explored but we're always going to need what this movie said to me made me feel was that we're always going to need thoughtful and thought provoking reminders, a reframing of our perspective from time to time. And, and this one does that. I know I just said, maybe there's not new things to take away, but beyond the novel approach, I'll note that there is one, I won't spoil it, even though they kind of allude to it in the trailer or we hear a bit of it. I'll note that there is one particular poetic idea that a character in the film presents that I'd never really considered before. It, it did actually feel like a complete reframing of this topic. And that's just one of the reasons why I do really love this movie. And that is all why we did add it to our golden brick shortlist. So it's a real contender for sure for that Golden Brick Award at the end of the year. I know we have half the year left and we're going to add some more titles into the mix, including during this list, but it's up there. It also has the most disarming laugh line that comes out of nowhere in a, in the most wonderful way where you know, the 15 year old is sort of like just lipping off and, you know, kind of do you trying to cope with this or just sort of figure out what, what's up with this talking McCall mm -hmm. and all that. And then, you know, she says something snide and he just says, is that sarcasm? And then, there's a, and then <laughs> right. she's like, yeah. I love sarcasm. <laughs> uh -huh. It's good. And it's not, I mean, it's played for a laugh, but it's not, it's, it's not played for a gag, you know, it's, it's just more like, yeah. ah, yeah. interesting mm -hmm. character wrinkle for the, the bird of death. Exactly. And can, so to that end, can the three of us make a pledge right now, since we all love this movie so much, can we not forget Arinze Kenny's performance when we come back to our year-end best supporting performances category. I'm not saying it has to be on any or all of our lists. I'm just saying, can we put him on the short list 
and not let it fall by the wayside. Because I think that tends to happen with vocal performances. And as we talked about, Adam, in our review, this is, yes, a brilliant vocal performance, but also him being there on set and being the physical presence of this macaw um, is crucial to how the other actors respond Mm -hmm. and the believability they have in the presence of this bird is because he was there on set performing the actions. So I just want to make sure he doesn't get forgotten in in this category and um, not saying he'll, he'll make the final list, but he deserves to be considered. The echo you leave, the legacy, your memory is how she lives. I'll sign your pledge. Thank you. I'll sign it. He will get consideration. I'll seal it. I'll seal <laughs> Michael. it. I'll sign and okay. seal it. Even, even better. Uh-huh. <laughs> Michael, you're number three. My number three is uh, a film I just caught up with. And, and, and you know, uh, my bad on me to not having seen it a little earlier, but it's Alice Rohrwalker's La Chimera, uh, which I, uh, which we mentioned Josh O'Connor recently in, in, the, in the context of Challengers. And he plays, if you haven't seen it yet, he plays a disconsolate British tomb raider who is um, pining for his uh, either lost or possibly dead at the beginning, we find out later, uh, love. Uh, and he's kind of falling in uh, as he returns to his uh, village. He's falling back in with these um, sort of village uh, tomb raiders as they go looking for Etruscan, priceless Etruscan pottery. Uh, and he has a... Um, the central character has a, has a divining rod, and he's got a somewhat magical uh, way of locating, just just like um, just like the Rainmaker, <laughs> the old play in the movie. Um, you know, fi- finding what is most valuable. It's not water this time; it's uh, it's Etruscan pottery. And there's a, there's a wonderful speaking of magical realism. Roarwalker is is just working at a level that it just it just feels like the most easy breathing, relaxed sort of acknowledgement of some other forces in life than the forces we see on the ground every day. Uh, and I thought this film, it took a little while for me to get the rhythm of it. That was also true of her previous film, Happy as Lazaro. But when this one really kind of clicks in, in every way, uh, in, in its in its central romance, in the uh, scenes with uh, Isabella Rossellini, with and every one of the supporting players, at the midway point, man, I was really in. And then I just sort of happily in the, in the hands of a terrific, terrific international filmmaker. Uh, so I, I, I love it. And, uh, I was late to it and I'm, I'm sad about that, but, uh, but I saw it. Yeah. We're, we're very late to it, aren't we, Josh? As in (laughs) we, we didn't get to it. And just a quick disclaimer, we missed our, our chance to see it really because the reason we haven't prioritized it is because for us, it's a 2023 film and that it did get that late December release. Uh, yeah. That's at least why I haven't prioritized it. Maybe I shouldn't speak for you, Josh, but Michael is above our petty little rules here on film spotting. <laughs> and many people <laughs> are considering La Chimera because of that kind of, what was it? February release yeah. considering it a 2024. That's right. It's film. the, we, so, I mean, it's the, we grow now card, you know, a uh, card. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, there you go. Yeah. Sometimes if, yeah. if it works in your favor, one, you one, I, whether or not I can consider it for my top 10 or not, despite how much I may end up loving it, I still feel like I have to see this film, Josh. Yeah, Too many this, people this that the, I trust have loved it. Exactly. And, you know, this is the Josh O'Connor theater I, I need to go into. Yeah, this is the one I want to see, having mm-hmm. seen some of his other work, but not this one, and being excited, so excited about what he did in my number three, Challengers. I'm going to add to the Challengers praise here. I, guys, it was a kind of a crazy day. I only had an hour or so to put together this top five list we're doing. You know how I pulled it off? I put on the Challengers original soundtrack (laughs) by Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross. The thing was done in like 50 minutes flat. It just, that deliriously clubby score, it, it, it drove me right through it. It's also, it's one of the reasons this might be the most purely entertaining movie of the year so far. Uh, I've been describing it as this love triangle framed by a rectangle following these these tennis pros who are intertwined over the years in various ways. And one facet of the brilliant screenplay by Justin Kritzkis, and this is his first screenplay, we should mention, is the way it jumps around in time, you know, while while being framed by this climactic match between the two men. Then you've got Luca Guadagnino, director, bringing 
what I would describe as an almost comical sensuality to the proceedings. But it's the cast that makes this more than a campy lark. They are all bringing a deep humanity to each of these characters who are flawed in their own specific ways that somehow doom this triad of a relationship in specific ways. Uh, it's it's just absolutely fascinating to watch. How often does this happen? Going after the same girl? Come here. Which one of us? I can listen to that soundtrack anytime. I can't wait to watch this, though, once more in its entirety, just for the thrill of it. Uh, right now, it's in a tricky place. It looks like you can rent it on Amazon and YouTube for $19.99. You can also just buy a digital copy there and at some other places. So however you do it and whenever you do it, don't let 2024 go by without seeing Challengers. Okay. You have been officially warned by all of us now, the Challengers is very good if you haven't had a chance to see it yet, and you need to make sure that you do. And I'm going to add my number three into that mix, Josh. I think it's a movie that a lot of people probably have overlooked, but is available VOD now on many platforms. And you alluded earlier to how it's always nice when we see Golden Brick nominees from the past come through with their next effort. Well, I'm going to go from Tuesday... And Dinah Opusik, a 2024 nominee to uh, follow up from a 2021 Golden Brick nominee. What's audacious about Rose Glass's Love Lies Bleeding? I offer you Ed Harris as a devilish desert crime kingpin who collects and occasionally likes to munch on large insects. Is there a name for his hairstyle? That's my burning question. They they say a mullet is business in the front, party in the back. He's got a three-day drug-fueled bender in the back and <laughs> a cue ball in the front. It, it, There's nothing. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, uh, it, I, I mean, it's that's, quite jarring. The way I, the, what, what I went with was he's a Sasquatch who had a bad run-in with a ceiling fan. I mean, that's all. Okay, well, that, <laughs> that's all there that is nails it. it. We just need to distill that down into something catchier, something you can take to your barber if you admire, perhaps, Ed Harris's character. You, you got you to think that, that character's barber is lying at the bottom of that gorge. You know, oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. Exactly. There's, all, there's exactly. a pile of barbers down there. <laughs> it, it's almost as jarring as the sudden and vivid jolts of violence we get in this noir twist about a, a manager of a gym, Lou, who's played by Kristen Stewart. She falls in love with Jackie, a bodybuilder who has dreams of striking it big in the industry at a competition in Las Vegas. All of that's almost as jarring as Glass's merger of horror, body horror, and magical realism. And to be clear, every time I'm using the word jarring here, I mean it as a compliment because I was on board for all of it, including Glass's dynamic use of color. There isn't a single composition in this film that isn't textured and evocative and beautifully lurid. And it's not just about the color and the lighting. We get not only that great scene, you referenced the gorge, one of my favorite shots of the year I think is without sound except maybe some music of police cars at night with their headlights glowing overhead as they head out to that gorge. And everything about that shot just tells us what we already know because it's been suggested that that they're going to come upon something that's going to break everything wide open. It just adds a, a grand scale to this film, but also those nightmarish flashback sequences we get with no sound again between Kristen Stewart's character and Harris. It's just slow motion close-ups and they're bathed in that satanic red. And with this film and with St. Maud, you've got two striking portrayals of passionate, <laughs> determined, ambitious, and, and perhaps with some justification, disturbed misfits. I can't wait to see what Rose Glass does next, but for now, we can still enjoy Love Lies Bleeding from this year. Also, Katie M. O'Brien, really good. I mean, I remember seeing so her. So good. You know, yeah. like That's just, Jackie. It's just kind of oh, just enduring uh, Quantumania, the Ant-Man film. And then she comes in as, you know, a supporting character. 
handful of lines and it was suddenly a movie you know and and it's just <laughs> this I, I can't imagine and i like i like this film a great deal um i don't i'm not i have to see it again to see if, what my issues with the last 20 minutes really were if the leap was too much for me um usually i'm like bigger give me a real leap not a half leap but you know <laughs> This was like 17 leaps, so maybe like 14 yeah. leaps. I don't know. <laughs> yes, but, it was. But I yes, need to see was. it again. I need to see it again. Um, uh, and I s- certainly enjoyed the one time I saw it. But yeah, that, that, that's a good description of it. A couple more picks to go. You can always find our top fives at filmspotting.net slash lists. There are a couple of very easy ways you can help an independently produced show like ours. Whether you're a longtime listener or if you're just finding us, take a minute and give us a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. It's easy. You could do it right now. Every new rating or review does help us reach new listeners. Val City Gal gave us a brief five-star review on Apple Podcasts, calling us an enjoyable and enlightening show. We'll take it. How, how long did that take? You you could do that right now. Just put in a few different adjectives and you're done with it. And we would go be, to your thesaurus online. Go to your thesaurus. It'll help you out. We'd be very appreciative as we are to you, Val City Gal. Another way to support us, join the Film Spotting family at filmspottingfamily.com. We welcome new family plus member Alex Garcia. He's in Madrid. I'm guessing that's Spain. Madrid, Spain. Could be wrong. Alex says, I found you searching on the internet about movie podcasts. That was around six years ago. The Madness series. This is a a great little bit here for Michael Phillips. He says, the Madness series has always been the best since it helps me discover movies I haven't seen or have forgotten. I like the bracket process and get surprised very often about the results. The older the decade, the better, Alex says. But he also enjoys, Michael, you may disagree. You guys may see Film Spotting Madness a little bit differently, but you know what he loves? The top 10 films of the year episodes in December. They're long, but so engaging. Of course, Michael, a key part of those. The last movie Alex saw in the theater, Poor Things. I liked it, but I agree with the term one of you used. This was you, Josh. In your review, exhausting. (laughs) Yeah, that was me. Mm. No, I I thought it was exhilarating. I'm going to go with another EX word. Favorite movie he revisited recently. And man, it's a good one. Brief Encounter. Mm. David Lean Hitchcock is a random film or filmmaker that he loves. A movie he credits with becoming a cinephile. Mulholland Drive and Barry Lyndon. Two great choices Mm. there. And finally, a favorite book about movies or movie making. One I had to read in film school and I have recommended at least a couple times here on the show. And it's it's an easy read too. It's pretty it's pretty quick. It's In the Blink of an Eye by Walter Murch. Thank you, Alex, and welcome to the Film Spotting family. In addition to keeping us doing what we're doing, your support comes with perks like you get to listen early and ad free. You get the weekly newsletter. You get monthly bonus shows new in the feed. We went back to 1994. We talked about The Crow starring Brandon Lee. Next week, we will drop an Ask Us Anything segment. Great questions from our listeners to reckon with and ask us anything, Josh. Michael, can you give us like a one sentence take on The Crow 94? Did you see it? Did you like it? What's your memory of it? Didn't see it. It was, that was, that was my theater period. I was probably watching uh, some dinner theater production of, uh, you know, Mandel La Mancha or Showboat or something. Were there, were there ravens or crows in it? (laughs) No, no, but actually I, I, I want to mention too, that I, while you, while you were just finishing up the, um, uh, Alex's letter from uh from madrid uh i just finished up a, a little reddit uh, five star rating myself actually and uh shattering and beautiful that's my quote that's the show <laughs> Ooh, shattering wow. and beautiful. michael phillips dash michael phillips that's shattering and beautiful that's a glorious blurb coming we'll in july it. bonus content a 1999 movie draft with me josh sam and maybe you all current family plus or film spotting advisory board members that's current but new members who joined by july 15th will all have their names thrown in the film spotting hat for a chance to join us for that draft. Somehow I've already started prepping for the 1999 movie draft. Josh. I'm not not surprised at all. I, I rated like how you prioritize like 40 your 40 movies is, is a complete mystery to me. Hey, don't judge. Filmspottingfamily.com for more. You know what's funny? What? Every moment of my life is hell. You actually seem very happy to me a lot of the time. It's hell. I don't think it'll last, though. I'm actually pretty unhappy, too. 
That's from Janet Planet, which expands to more theaters this weekend, including here in Chicago. It's the feature directing debut of playwright Andy Baker and stars Julianne Nicholson as the single mom of 11-year-old Lacey, played by newcomer Zoe Ziegler. The film, set in the early 90s, is told largely from Lacey's perspective. Josh, we have already said the words golden brick too often on the show. If you're drinking every time we say it, you're you're going to get hammered. It's a problem. But, you know, Andy Baker may be established... <laughs> pretty well established as a playwright new as a filmmaker janet planet does it need to be added to the list yeah i think so i mean it's it's quietly provocative and quietly inventive in terms of the filmmaking you know that's one of the things we do look for is is bold sometimes we'll use that terminology not just an emerging filmmaker but a movie that has a very clear vision and i think this absolutely does especially in terms of that perspective, how Baker uses the tools of filmmaking to give us the experience that Lacey has over the course of the summer. So yeah, I like this film quite a bit. Totally fine with giving it a golden brick nod. Yeah, we've both seen it. So Josh, we're going to spend a couple minutes here on it. Michael, you though have seen at least two productions of Andy Baker's work. So maybe you can jump in and correct me if anything goes askew here. But I've only seen the flick. I saw it at Steppenwolf in Chicago. So I I am going to tread a little carefully talking about her work, but a quick Google search today confirmed the notion that it seems impossible to talk about Annie Baker's work without using some form of the phrase deeply observed, or at least the word observed. (laughs) The flick is very much about behavior. Instead of action, scenes play out deliberately and demand not just your attention as a viewer, but engagement. It's highly subjective what each audience member chooses to focus on on the stage and what they take away. It all varies. And so my assumption going into this movie, only knowing what it was about and having not seen any previews, was that an Annie Baker film might employ a sort of Paul Schrader-esque transcendental style in unsophisticated terms, you know, long shots, long takes, the movie frame, essentially replacing the theater proscenium. My assumption was completely wrong because you could still categorize this movie as one that's deeply observed, but Baker relies on close-ups to align us with Lacey's point of view. And she transfers the audience's responsibility to observe to her. Lacey is the audience for Janet Planet, by which I mean the, the drama that's unfolding around and including her mother. If you think about it, this summer that we see is structured as three acts, each one centered on a different character. And I do mean capital C character that comes into her orbit. And Lacey watches and she tries to make sense of it all. But she's also a biased observer because she's not really interested in sharing her mother with any of these people. And, And when she wants, unlike a theater audience, she can insert herself into the story. She can possibly even influence the action, which she does on occasion. So, you know, in a play, in an Annie Baker play, would we notice a moment like when someone comes to take some things away from a room where someone's staying and Lacey and the camera linger on this little piece of paper Mm -hmm. when a New Yorker cover is torn off the wall and a little bit of the tape and a little bit of the paper stay there on the wall. Now, if we were in a theater and that, that stayed there on a wall, maybe we'd pay attention to it. Maybe we wouldn't even notice it. Maybe we'd turn our attention to something else, but we, we linger and we look at it here because Lacey focuses on it. And I even, I even love what the cover itself kind of, the fact that it opens, it requires you then to kind of interpret it in a way where it's like this woman was there and then she was gone just ripped away from the scenario, like the cover itself. And it's almost like that piece of tape and that little bit of paper in the end will be the only evidence that she was ever even there. And then like Will Patton plays her mother's boyfriend in act one. And Lacey's clearly not a big fan, but even if she didn't express it verbally, we'd know it because he's like faceless for the first 15 to 20 minutes of the movie, right? right? Like I didn't know it was Will Patton until about 20 minutes in when we finally get to look at his face. The camera is always at a distance from him and he's, he's just a presence in this film. 
Yeah, I, I think I've seen this is kind of a crazy setup here, but I've seen exactly 50, 55 old minutes of it, just about half of it. Uh, and I'm going to finish this film up for review tomorrow after we tape this podcast. So, but I'm, I'm with you with, with everything on that. I think Annie Baker's showing a, an awfully good instinct in her first feature uh, about how to, how to kind of take what works and has worked in various styles she's written in, you know, for the stage for, you know, for three decades now. And figure out how to, how am I going to sort of deal with that visually? I I, I got in mm-hmm. the in the opening you know forty fifty minutes, Josh. I got a little more of the sense that she was willing to just actually you know oh you're going this twenty twenty five seconds is going to take a, uh, take a while. I mean it takes twenty mm-hmm. twenty five seconds, sure. but it, it's twenty twenty five seconds that are that's composed just two people walking down to get a, you know, to get, or it's not rushed. Nothing is right. Yeah. And it's, and it's, it's just not the kind of 20 seconds you see in the average movie, you know, you can look forward to Michael's review over at Chicago Tribune.com. Janet planet currently playing in limited release. If you see it and agree or disagree with our thoughts, we would love to hear from you. Feedback at filmspotting.net. We had the entire cabinet on a trip to the Far East. We had one-third of a combat division returning from Germany in the air above the United States at the time of the shooting. At 12.34 p.m., the entire telephone system went out in Washington for a solid hour. And on the plane back to Washington, word was radioed from the White House Situations Room to Lyndon Johnson that one individual performed the assassination. Does that sound like a bunch of coincidences to you, Mr. Garrison? No. Not for one moment. One of those scenes there that I'm sure we all saw popping up on our social media feeds over the past week. Sadly, the late, great Donald Sutherland in Oliver Stone's JFK. Donald Sutherland was 88 years old and a beloved actor, certainly based on the outpouring of affection for him. And you look back at his performances in that career, received an honorary Oscar in 2018. Otherwise, somehow, no Oscar nominations. 200 Features, almost 200 features going back to the mid 60s. I'll list a few of the main ones here. And then, Michael, would love to hear your thoughts. Maybe you have a favorite Sutherland performance. It's among these titles or is not. The Dirty Dozen in 67. He was Hawkeye in Altman's MASH in 70. Also that year, he was in Kelly's Heroes with Clint Eastwood. Clute with Jane Fonda in 71, Don't Look Now, 73, Philip Kaufman's Invasion of the Body Snatchers in 78, also that year, Animal House, of course, Ordinary People in 1980. That was the film that I went to and started immediately looking up clips from, and I haven't even mentioned Backdraft, Six Degrees of Separation, Ad Astra, Outbreak. Many will think of him as President Snow in The Hunger Games. Any of those in particular stand out for you, Michael? Uh, well, it certainly stood, uh, uh, President Snow in The Hunger Games stood out for the uh, headline writers at the Tribune because that was the, the thing they led with completely. You know, it's, it's like, oh, that's the one mm-hmm. they've seen. What's, what's remarkable to me is when you go back to 1970 with MASH and take it through ordinary people 1980 if you just just look at it as the decade of the 70s he was he was even a more prominent and kind of vital part of that decade than i than i realized and and even you know i just had never sort of stacked all that up i mean when you look at uh, when you when you see talent like his it it tends to follow he's not like anybody else but actors on that order follow the directors they believe in and that they want to learn from and he did that with everybody from you know Fellini to you know Philip Kaufman and and uh, Nicholas Rogue. I, I mean, Don't Look Now is staggering. I think and the fact that it was it was a popular success it really speaks awfully well of that decade. You know, because it's a tough, pretty nervy adaptation of that story. But uh, and yes, yeah, some of the filmmaking is of the time. But man, that performance, unbelievable. He he just never stopped learning. He was an incredibly scholarly guy never unbelievably curious uh, good researcher you know i mean i mean just and took his job seriously even on i mean like look at the jfk thing not my favorite movie mm-hmm. i think that scene is uh he does more than save it i mean he he makes it sound cogent and compelling and that's more than i can say for <laughs> most does. of that film uh, i know i'm in the minority on that but the fact that he took two months i think to memorize that and find it and just and make sure that he was not just sort of just barely off book, but like ready to rip and make every new development packed into that whatever, how many minutes it is like 
vital information we must know, and here's why. I mean, that's that is an acting class. I, I, mm-hmm. uh, I but he's also he's also he was lucky enough to work all those years and uh, more than more than occasionally work with material that he that really was up to his level. So uh, it's a it's a sad loss, but but a wonderful career. Follow that, Josh. Well, you look at that run from 70 to 80 and the titles there, and it is either someone who has the right instinct or the good fortune, uh, as you're, as you're suggesting, Michael, something to, to get involved with these major works from that decade. And yeah, I guess the question I'd have for you, Michael, is I've got two major blind spots when it comes to Sutherland. And if I'm looking to correct those, do I do I go with, if you've seen both of these, do I go with Dirty Dozen, 67, so a little bit before that decade I'm talking about, or I've never seen Altman's Mash, which, is haunt, which haunts me like on a monthly basis for a different reason each month. And now it's haunting me again. Um, but just in terms of Sutherland, you know, is do I start with an earlier effort like Dirty Dozen in 67, or do I just do I just check MASH off that list of blind spotting titles? I mean, all the stuff he did in the 60s is, is fascinating because there's so much of it's just, you know, a television and uh, the Hammer horror films he'd made over in London when he was broke and struggling. And uh, yes, the Dirty Dozen kind of got him launched in a, just a, in a matter of really just a scene or a scene and a half where he stood out because there was some sort of edge some comic insolence that everybody kind of caught on to. Man, you got to see Mash. I mean, it's a problematic classic, and I, I do think it's a classic. I, th- I mean, that film was hugely influential in my young life, unfortunately, because it's just an adolescent boys' club, you know, uh, uh, sex comedy, basically. But, you know, for the time, it had a kind of a stunning quality of improvisation to it, to the point where both stars... Sutherland and Elliot Gould didn't know what the hell was going on when they were making it because they didn't, they didn't understand that the script was essentially thrown away, that they were kind of winging it. And, I mean, they tried mm-hmm. to get I, I, different different accounts on this, and I don't really know all my research on it, but, but I think they tried to get Altman kicked off that film, or they I know Gould tried to get out, you know, uh, just like Cary Grant did with Leo McCary back when uh, The Awful Truth came along in 37. Sometimes you get an improv-based director and they freak actors out because <laughs> it's like, <laughs> what are the, I don't know how I'm doing. And and you yeah. should see it, Josh, just to see, find out, you know, is he comfortable completely with the style they're, they're after in this thing? Not entirely. Is, this, is the casting of those two still somehow magic, Sutherland and Gould? Yes. I mean, it is. And, um, you know, the film does leave a little bit of a taste in the mouth, always... Uh, for me, because it is, it's misogynist as hell and all the rest of it. But, uh, and I don't want to dismiss that, but I also don't want to dismiss the the qualities of it that still make it worth looking at and make his performance, you know, that, that film was huge. And that's what really made people like Elliot Gould and Donald Sutherland, especially, you know, like, you know, and by many measurements, bankable, thank God. Hmm. Yeah. You don't need my opinion on that after hearing that, Josh, but I will agree with Michael and say that if I was just going by film, I might say the dirty dozen, but if we're just going Sutherland, it definitely has to be mash. And part of that too, just goes back to, I I don't know if I know his career well enough to say playing against type, but just looking at these titles, you think of movies like Clute and ordinary people where he can play kind of an ordinary guy, or he can be someone who's mysterious and a little bit sinister, a little scary, like he is even in that JFK scene, certainly in that one scene he's in, in Backdraft. We get that with President Snow. Yes, there's Animal House, but otherwise I don't think of him as a comedic actor. Like like we see him get to flex that muscle in, in MASH a little bit more, Michael. Is that fair to say? I think so, yeah. They're trying to – it's it's really just an actor with the – Fair amount of good, you know, Rada. I think he, I think he studied Rada in, in London when he was young. You know, stage training and just trying to figure out what is this sort of new hip now San Francisco the committee sort of improv comedy we're going for here. I don't quite get it, but I'm going to give it a shot. And uh, it, it's it's just it's a fascinating working out of this. Uh, I think for those two stars of Mash, a riddle about style and you know i mean the movie sailed with both guys uh, you know a big part of the success but yeah it's uh yeah, check it out see i'd like to hear what you think of it josh i i sincerely would like to hear what you think of it josh <laughs> i will sincerity i will man. report back 
The Night is Young, Sincerity from Michael Phillips. This early, the current deeply flawed film spotting poll looks ahead to Kinds of Kindness, the latest from Yorgos Lanthimos and Emma Stone. It's out in limited release. In fact, this weekend opening at the Music Box with a 35 millimeter special run. We are asking you to choose a single Lanthimos film. Now, this is where it gets a little tricky. It says, according to producer Sam, for yourself and for posterity. You can only make one choice. It has to check both those boxes. It's the film for you, the one I suppose you enjoy the most, admire the most, want to watch again the most, but also thinking about it within a larger context. It's not just about you. It's about the world and which film would most benefit others. So your pick, Josh, was The Lobster. It's in Mm -hmm. the lead. The favorite, though, is not far behind. We left out Alps, Michael. Sorry. We also included Dogtooth. The Killing of a Sacred Deer, and Poor Things. Do you have a clear, easy choice? The one I'd like to see again, the mo- that I'd most like to see a second time, I only saw it once, was The Lobster. So I, I, would, I would vote Lobster. Okay. Josh will share those poll results next week. I'm off. Little family vacation. Roxana Haddadi from Vulture will sit in and... We will get to Kinds of Kindness in a couple of weeks here on the show. You can vote and leave a comment in that Lanthimos poll at filmspotting.net. Quick note about our sister podcast, The Next Picture Show. They've got a new pairing out, Inside Out 2 with Pixar's Brave. Always love Pixar talk. Very eager to hear what the group makes of both of those. New episodes of The Next Picture Show post every Tuesday, and you can find them wherever you get your podcasts. It is time now for Massacre Theater, the part of the show where we perform a scene and you get a chance to win a film spotting prize. A couple of weeks back, we massacred this scene. You're a government spook? Yes. I mean, no, I was before, but I'm not now. Uh, But that's all irrelevant, really. The idea of governments, nations is public relations theory at this point. Don't. I don't want to hear about the theories. I want to hear about the dead people. Explain the dead people. Who do you kill? That's very complicated, but... In the beginning, you know, it matters, of course, that you have something to hang on to, you know, a specific ideology to defend, right? I mean, taming unchecked aggression, that was my personal favorite. Other guys like live free or die, but, you know, you get the idea. But that's all bullshit, and I know that now. That's all bullshit. You do it because you're trained to do it, you were encouraged to do it, and ultimately, you know, you get to like it. That was John Cusack and Minnie Driver in 1997's Gross Point Blank, written by D.V. DeVicentis, Steve Pink, Tom Jankowitz, and Cusack, and it was directed by George Armitage. That massacre was part of a show a couple of weeks ago when we reviewed Richard Linklater's Hitman, alongside Inside Out 2 and Ghost Light. So why that scene? Well, Sarah Swale from Tacoma, Washington has this. The connection to Hitman is obvious, as both are best described as a rom-com with an assassin. But Gross Point also involves angsty teenage emotions, so maybe also a tie to Inside Out 2. John Cusack is anxiety personified after all. <laughs> Here's Josh Ashen Miller in LA. First degree connection hitman, OBS. Second degree, last week's show mentioned another film set in a suburb on the shore of a great lake, Ghost Light, which takes place in Waukegan, Illinois. We were definitely thinking about that. Third degree, the Massacre Theater scene, we were not thinking of this. The Massacre Theater scene was Cusack with Minnie Driver. On the show, you talked about Inside Out 2, which features joy, rage, anxiety at all as the mini drivers of Riley's thoughts and feelings. Sorry if this gets me permanently blocked. I understand. Josh, <laughs> At I, least am, he's I am aware. shaking my head <laughs> yeah. right now. Chaperone Josh is vigorously, really upset. Vigorously head shaking. Ben Carr also wrote in from Los Angeles by way of Rogers Park. The film is the classic gross point blank starring Chicago boys, John Cusack, Steve Pink and D.V. DeVicentis. I got to see it at the Evanston Theater and met Jeremy Piven afterwards. Writers Pink, DeVicentis, and Cusack would, of course, go on to write the now Chicago classic High Fidelity. I was the pink-haired skater kid in the film. How about that? Of which there is a new book about the filming called Top 5, How High Fidelity Found Its Rhythm and Became a Cult Movie Classic by Andrew Buss. Adam, have you sued? Or... Should I ask, have they sued you yet? Yeah, exactly. I definitely (laughs) lifted the idea from the book. (laughs) Let's be clear. Oh, boy. Ben continues. I love the show. I found it during the pandemic. I enjoyed the insightful and friendly movie banter with a familiar and heartwarming hard A Chicago accent. It makes (laughs) me feel at home. I don't know what 
Ben I is think talking that's you, about because I'm an well, Iowan and I don't I, have an accent. I have to say, Jody Comer's performance in Bike Riders, we covered oh, yeah. this in our review. Yeah. It has me like when I'm out talking to to people, second guessing myself yeah. quite often. You you don't hear yourself. That's exactly what you sound like. Patrick <laughs> from Logan Square. In our home, we watch Gross Point Blank at least once a year, and you may hear me quoting Dan Aykroyd's demented killer for hire, Grocer, exclaiming, bing, bang, boom, popcorn from time to time. It's criminally overlooked, and I always list it as one of my most underrated comedies of the last few decades. When watching Hitman, the tie-in crossed my mind, too. It doesn't have the same chaotic balance of elevated violence or comedic chops the Gross Point Blank does. And although I like Powell quite a bit, he could have used a touch of Cusack's gloom and danger to balance out that smirk that he employs so effectively. But it does do the thing that always impresses me about Gross Point. It gives you a top-notch ensemble of fleshed-out characters that play to the height of their intelligence, and it trusts the audience to keep up with them. One more comment here from David who hails from Roswell, Georgia. I saw this in the theater with a group of friends. We loved it so much, we saw it again a week later, but brought a friend of mine who hadn't seen it yet. Honestly, we ruined it for him because we were quoting the lines and then looking at him to see if he was laughing. Lesson learned. I never did anything like that again. You can't be that guy. Oh, gosh. That sounds like possibly the most annoying thing in the world. Sorry, David. Even just hearing that anecdote, I think I have to quit. I mean, I just quit. It's it's too much. (laughs) Oh, no, we've lost Michael. Thanks, David. Thanks a lot. <laughs> uh huh. Josh, the film spotting hat is fairly brimming this week. So much love for Gross Point Blank. Why don't you reach in and pick out this week's winner? Our winner is Ben Watson from Seattle. Congratulations, Ben. Email feedback at filmspotting.net. We will set you up with your very own film spotting t shirt or tote bag or trial membership into the film spotting family. Broadsheet journalists have described my impressions as stunningly accurate. Well, they're wrong. I've not heard your Michael Caine, but I assume it would be something along the lines of, my name's Michael Caine. That is where you are so wrong. We move on to this week's edition of Massacre Theatre. I don't think we're going to need to give any hints. I'll say this, and I kind of have to say it because I know there are some people out there who adore, many people out there who adore this film and might even be reciting it along with us. We have, well, we've bastardized it. Uh, Charitably, you could say we've adapted it. We have combined some parts, multiple parts into one. That's the part I will be playing. And we've alighted things a little bit. We've we've really just ruined it. We've ruined the scene. (laughs) And now we're going to ruin it with our acting. Now, because he's our guest, Josh, I offered a pick of roles. To Michael Phillips of course. earlier in the day. And he decided to go with the person who starts the scene. I'm very eager to hear it. I I know my role here in Massacre Theater. Like I know, I know what I'm good slash terrible at. And so I'm gonna play that. You gotta you have to save us here. And I will offer this performance with nothing but dignity and respect. <laughs> Always. Dignity and respect. That's true. I always do, but particularly particularly in this case. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Michael, you started off. I'm going to give you the action. Are you ready? I was born ready for this role. And? (laughs) And? Action. You must go and visit him at once. Good heavens. People. Sorry, I I, I stuttered there. I jumped in. You were too ready. I was too ready. From from the top. Now I have to come up with a completely different line reading. (laughs) <laughs> here we go and action you must go and visit him at once good heavens people for we, we may not visit if you do not as you well know are you listening you never listen you must papa at once there's no need i already have have oh how can you tease me so have you no compassion for my poor nerves oh you mistake me my dear I have the highest respect for them. They've been my constant companions these 20 years. Papa! Is he amiable? Is he handsome? I will give my hearty consent to his marrying whichever the girls he chooses. So will he come to the ball tomorrow, Papa? I believe so. (laughs) Oh, God. Oh, God. (laughs) And You can't unhear that. And scene. Whatever you just did, Adam, sent a shiver. Up my spine. That was, a little, uh, that was what I was going for. That was, uh, <laughs> what would you prefer? <laughs> it, was, it was a little, you know, it, it can get a little 
sweaty and hot in this closet I uh-huh. record in, that yeah. was like cooled things down by 20 degrees. I'm, I'm sure. I think we all reached, you know what, we all reached a kind of a level of, of rare misunderstanding, <laughs> just persistent, you know, just keep going. Keep That's going. it. Keep going. That's it. If you know what film, we absolutely just massacred. Email the movie's title and your name and location to feedback at filmspotting.net. I don't think I even attempted a British accent. The deadline is Monday, July 8th. We'll select the winner randomly from all the correct entries in a couple of weeks. That was a little... That was a little... uh, (laughs) I was unsettled by it. Michael Scowl says it all. Uh It was unsettling. Uh, It was unsettling. This man with a face broken in half. He uh, is a victim of an accident. He uh, was going out from your whorehouse. Warehouse. No, no, uh, you know, funky creatures or whatever. The sounds of a festival favorite there. And Michael Phillips, your number two film of the year as we continue our countdown of the top five films of the year so far. Tell us about it. This is Do Not Expect Too Much from the End of the World. This is um, Radu uh, Jude's uh, really, really blistering black comedy from Romania. Uh, it's a great workplace comedy. I think it's one day in the life of this woman who's kind of a gopher and a driver, played by Alinka Manaloke, a fantastic young talent. And she's working for... Uh, a video production house that's been hired to to put together interviews for a workplace safety video this company wants, uh, and the lawyers involved are very intent on getting just so. And her job is to interview different uh, injured workers and sort of build the company's case uh, for them lest they get sued out of existence. And it's uh, it's just kind of her... Uh, travails all day. Very funny, uh, very, very sobering. And you just get a great sense of kind of where we are right now, <laughs> anywhere in this in this world of ours, about how we treat people and don't treat people, how we tell the truth and how we pretend like we're telling the truth, how we do a lot of things. Uh, I, I just found it as bracing as any. It reminded me of some of the Romanian films I saw in that sort of first amazing wave that came around, you know, 2005, 2006. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's my kind of comedy, uh, meaning it, it just tastes like nothing like, except ashes in the mouth, you know, but it, but it's, I mean, it's not my only kind of comedy, but I, I respond to it very kind of, and I guess just naturally, I, and especially when it's got the life that this lead performance has. I, I, I really like it. Eager to see it again. Not easy, but that's all right. Capitalism isn't easy. It's my number six, Michael, and I think a second watch might bump it up even higher than that because it's a tough watch. You describe it as a comedy, which is accurate, but blistering, which you said is more accurate, I think. And the lead performance is blistering. But that is the thing, you know, Alinka Manolake shot to the top of my list of female performances of the year right now after seeing this. I knew that even though this is in many ways a very, you sympathize with her position, even as she's pretty despicable <laughs> throughout much of the film, but you understand why you, you start to see as this goes on, how she is carrying herself as a reaction of where she's been put. And yeah, this is one I definitely do want to take another look at, even though it is quite long, it's quite intense. Um, it is funny in moments, but I forget how you put it, but, you, you know, better than this. But those laughs that stuck get stuck in your throat, it's that sort of comedy. And it's a it's a real achievement, I think. So definitely glad you highlighted here, made it in your top five. My number two, however, going to go in a different direction. The People's Joker, one that we raved about on this show. Adam, and you know, if Hundreds of Beavers isn't the wildest thing I've watched this year, and and yes, I did catch up with that. I know we have listeners who love Hundreds of Beavers. I enjoyed it quite a bit, even if it's not going to make the cut here for me. I got to say, if that isn't the wildest thing I watched this year, it's only because I saw Vera Drew's designer desktop hodgepodge of of Batman mythology, queer identity, and and anti-corporate shenanigans. This is something Drew co-wrote, directed, edited. Drew stars as Joker the Harlequin, this trans woman trying to find herself and and a community, really, in this dystopian Gotham City. This involved 
over 100 creative contributors, which, you know, at a big budget effort doesn't sound like much, but this was not a big mm-hmm. budget effort by any means. That speaks to the communal nature of this project. All these unique skills came together to help with the character designs, the background imagery, the costumes we see. This thing is so creative and original. I'm going to name it again. Grab your beer or your shot glass. This is why it got our golden brick nod when we reviewed it on the show. Now, despite so many direct references to Warner Brothers material, Drew has managed to stave off corporate censorship to a degree, claiming fair use. This has been screened here and there so that we get what we get is a Batman movie of sorts, but it's from the ground up rather than coming from the IP gods down. Uh, It's a completely different direction and you experience it that way. What is it about the wrong kind of man? Mm. You know how I feel about rubber nipples, Bruce. I imagine when most little boys watched the bat nipple love scene from Legends of the Cape Crusader, they probably wanted to be Batman and screw Nicole Kidman. I'm sure this was a sexual awakening for a lot of young men, but I watched it and I wanted to be Nicole Kidman. Was this why my mom didn't usually let me watch PG-13 movies? Does every PG-13 movie make little boys want to become girls someday? It took years of moments like this. Now, of course, this still limits the exhibition options. So it's been making the rounds in, in all sorts of inventive ways. We've mentioned on the show a couple of times, and those listening to this episode early, there's still a chance if you're near Spring Green, Wisconsin, producer Sam, he's holding a June 30 screening of the People's Joker as part of his movie club that he does there. Otherwise, looks like this is going to be available on Blu-ray August 13. So that might be, I, I'm thinking that's going to be the chance most people have to mm-hmm. see this. It is well worth it. Again, my wildest movie experience of the year so mm-hmm. far, and that is why it's at number two. It is well worth it. And I'm going to now transition into a film that, well, pretty much everyone can see, at least everyone who has Netflix. And I'm glad, Michael, that you're here because Josh claimed to like it, but Hmm. had a lot of negative things to say about my number two film. It's my Furiosa, Michael. This is my Furiosa. (laughs) I know that you strongly considered it for your list, even if I'm guessing it's not going to clock in at number one, Hitman. And It wasn't a great idea to prepare my notes today going in order from five down to one because I didn't do Hitman any favors watching clips from it after watching clips from Love Lies Bleeding. Richard Linklater's big swings here are decidedly not visual, which I will come back to. But that doesn't mean the former college baseball player doesn't take some strong wax. And it's all about structure. At multiple points, it seems clear. And this is my experience, but I know from talking to others as well it seems clear where this movie is going and what notes you expect it to hit. And if anyone out there tries to tell me that they correctly predicted anything close to resembling the circumstances Glenn Powell and Adria Arona put themselves in and the decisions they ultimately make, I will tell you that you're a liar. Linklater and Powell are acutely aware of how audiences consume hitman movies and noirs, and they riff on those narratives and those expectations in surprising ways and sometimes silly ways. The movie is very funny at times and in ways that, like we expect from a a good Linklater movie, uh, in, in ways that still deliver the philosophical provocations that we get from him. I mean, I know, Josh, you're a prefer salty to sweet scold, so you wouldn't get it, but is there a truer maxim than all pie is good pie? No. There isn't. It's the truest thing we've heard on screen this year. Give me year. a bowl of potato chips any day. Ugh, man, I, I, I now want to hire a hitman and, and we can solve this <laughs> once and for all. Which one? Visually. Which one okay. would you hire, Adam? Mm, you know, <laughs> the, the one that resembles Tilda Swinton, I think. So <laughs> I'm going to come back to this because I do love this movie. That's why I have it at number two. I've seen it twice. The only movie on the list I've watched a second time. But because I know, Michael, you've got my back and you love this film. I have seen this notion catch a little steam on social and I wrestled with it as I was watching it the first time. I I was aware of it in that very early diner scene where Powell pretends to be a hitman for the first time. And I was watching it thinking, you know, Linklater isn't always the most daring visual stylist, but man, this seems pretty conventional and generic. 
the conversation, not the content of the conversation, but how it was being brought to life seemed to me that it could have been straight out of any generic Netflix romantic comedy. And it struck me because, as I said, even if you don't think of Linklater as an overly inventive filmmaker outside of his use of rotoscoping, I've always been able to account for formal choices he's making, no matter how talky the movies are. I couldn't do that here. And it's odd because it's Shane Kelly, who's the DP he's worked with many times. They've done projects going back to A Scanner Darkly. He shot Boyhood, Everybody Wants Some, Apollo 10 and a Half, and others. So is it is it a limitation of the movie? Or is it my limitation as a critic? Probably more likely. Or does it just not matter with this movie because it's so fun and sexy? Yeah. Uh, uh, boy, that's a tough one. It's a good argument. I, I, I'm aware of that sort of conversation going on in various social threads, uh, just about, you know, it looks, why does it look like a cruddy next Netflix film? You know, many people think, uh, and the, or, or they just take it straight to link later saying he's never been much of a visual, you know, stylist or, um, anything more than a, a, a good, a really, a really good humanist technician behind the camera, you know, aside from everything else he can do. Right. Um, uh, yes. Yeah, it's a limitation. I think Glenn Powell is still a slight limitation, even though this is the best and most effective he's, for me, he's been in any film. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he's just finally, slowly, gradually finding uh, a way to kind of modulate the smirk and kind of, you know, just find ways to be on camera without posing on camera. And I think, I think he's got a lot, maybe, you know, he's got a lot he can do that we haven't seen yet. Uh, and this film gets him, gets him a good way. Look, the reason I like this film a lot, and it did just miss my top five, is that it's a, it's a, it's a, it is, it's an unpredictable rom-com that is about, you know, a fake hit man. And that is based on a true story a little bit. And it, it doesn't have a punishing spirit. It doesn't have the usual use of mm -hmm. violence and brutality for laughs. It doesn't go see bad boys for that. It doesn't have a lot of things it's because of the sensibility behind the camera. Link later, he, any other director would have taken that same script and found a way to, well, we really need at least two more shootouts and then somebody has to get kicked to the face, uh, whatever. It is the gentlest film out there. I mean, you know, you, <laughs> Netflix, I'm sure the, I'm sure the suits at Netflix were like, what? But you know, I think, I think people actually respond to it because it is fundamentally both easygoing really amiable work and also it's got that weird sort of turn i don't want to give away where you have you know hot didn't mm -hmm. see didn't see that turn it's not right. it's not like a big surprise or a spring or big reveal it's just more right. like a really wow and it works it Adam, does. can i offer a little evidence that i'm not the complete villain when it comes to comes to hitman <laughs> i sure. mean this is a Go movie for it. i i enjoyed enough to We've got, I spent today, part of today, editing an article at Think Christian about Hitman. Because after all, this is this is a movie, quotes Nietzsche, right? Who famously wrote The Antichrist. And so we had, we had a writer who loved the movie quite a bit. Very appreciative post, exploring things way above my head. The Nietzsche-ness of it all. Wow. And, and what that might mean for this movie and this character and how we see ourselves, um, what we aspire to. And... I think you would like it. It's it's very a very glowing piece about Hitman that is probably not up now because I'm still not completely done editing it. By by the time this episode airs, people can find it at Think Christian. That was really well done. You get to come off gracious and magnanimous and plug the website. I mean, I'm doing what I can here. Uh-huh. <laughs> That brings us, I do want to check out that article. I, you know, I dabbled like everyone else in college in Nietzsche, you know, took an existentialism class once. It was early in the morning, but I made it through. Michael Phillips, your number one film of the year so far. It's Challengers, for God's sake. I mean, it, it's the one, you know, I saw that film very number happily. Number one. Twice, yes, yes. And, and, and it, Love it. I mean, it's... It's insane, really. I mean, the film, uh, it, it doesn't quite take place on any planet I've been to, but, you know, I love it. I love the, the, I love the fact that uh, this, these, I'm going to list the negative virtues lickety split. I love the fact that everybody's acting like a, just a louse, you know, in different keys and in yeah. different ways and mm -hmm. totally, and it, it, it doesn't, there's not any points for noble, you know, behavior or above board dealing with, you know, lifelong friends, none of it, uh, out the window. And somehow, 
the script and then sort of as souped up by uh, the director, Luca Guadagnino, uh, so that we really don't just want a little action visually for the, for the last glimpse extended sequence of the big match, but we're really begging for it. And we get, we get tennis balls right in the face over and over and over. <laughs> and somehow I was just grinning and ducking the whole, I mean, you know, that's that to me, that was like, you know, now we're talking 3d without it, you know, without 3d. But I also do, I do think it's a wonderful actor's showcase. My only issue with this movie is, I mean, it's elegant trash. That's what. That's that's how I'd put it. And I, I tried the best kind. I don't know, having seen it twice. I don't know personally if I'm not going to give it anything away. If the deliberate ambiguity at the end plays too much like indecision for me, or just uh, the wrong kind of ambiguity. I don't know. Mm. I don't know. Well, why? Mm. Why do I need it? Why do I need a clear? We answer? disagree. Why do I need a clear? I mean, answer disagree with you, why? Michael, on that. Really? As I said, I, I, I've got to watch it a second time. So you're more experienced than I am. But I loved that okay. indecision, if you want to call it that, yeah, so much. Right. But, I, but I think your characterization, <laughs> your two word characterization of the movie, it's insane. That's <laughs> that's poster worthy. I love it. <laughs> I, that's a, that's a Michael Phillips blurb. That's great. There you go. Great. Well, I love it that like he, the key scene, like, you know, key discussion, you know, the flashback to uh, the Atlanta, where you sort of get the you get you get what really happened down in mm-hmm. Atlanta, right? Uh, it takes place in a windstorm that is really more like <laughs> yes, in, right. interstellar yes. level, you know, uh, weather. <laughs> yes, uh, this will this movie will be experienced as camp in ten to fifteen years for sure. And I don't know that that's a bad thing. I don't know that that's what the filmmakers are intending. I think it's more nuanced and I think mature maybe is a word I used to describe it. But I think that is going to happen for for elements like that, Michael. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's witty. Right. It's witty. And thank God. I mean, you, it is. Because you can't, you know, mm-hmm. you cannot buy that. You can't AI that on a rewrite. You know, that 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 there is real wit in it. And that's that's where a lot of the juice comes from. So, you know, again, thank God the actors, you know, respond to it. I want you to be my coach. What? Even if he wins the Open, completes his career Grand Slam, Art's still going to retire as someone who's just really, really good. That's what you guys will have done together. But imagine if you could turn Patrick Zweig into a guy who wins a slam. You still have a season. You still have one good season, and I need you to bring it out of me. So, what do you think? How f- dare you? Jesus Christ. You want my best piece of advice for you? You want me to coach you? Okay, quit. All right. My number one is a little less sexy. It does doesn't have the same score, doesn't move as fast. This is slow cinema, but man, it still has stuck with me. And it's inside the yellow cocoon shell. I talked about this uh, early on on the show, a debut feature from filmmaker Pham Tin An, uh, another golden brick nod here, follows basically a young man living in Vietnam who undergoes this spiritual crisis after the sudden death of his sister-in-law. That leaves him in charge of his little nephew because the father, so basically his brother, has left the family years before. So this kid has nobody, and and this guy steps in. So yeah, it's a work of slow cinema that's spiritually minded. So think Andre Tarkovsky, think uh, Picha Pong Rastakul. The thing is, Anne has such an incredible sense of command here that he makes this as approachable. I want to say it's approachable, as approachable as possible. Let's put it that way. He keeps pretension at bay because the movie has little bits of humor sprinkled in here or there. That helps incredibly. It's asking these big questions about eternity and heaven, but it has a humble curiosity about those. And it does all of this. If none of that interests you, I mean, if you're just an aesthetics person, check this out for the formal control. Each frame is incredibly bewitching and full of mystery. So it's worth it on that alone. As a matter of fact, here's what I'd suggest. Give the first 10 minutes of Inside the Yellow Cocoon Shell a try. This is an extended single take that I feel like in its form and really the theme, sets it sets up and sums up the entire movie. So it's either going to pull you in and you're like, I'm locked in for this long running time, or maybe it's not your thing. That's fine because it's going to give you a good taste of what 
the film is like. And you can try that. You can do it right now. It is streaming for free on Hoopla, if anyone has Hoopla. But you can also rent it on Amazon, Apple TV, Google Google Play, Vudu, and YouTube. Right now, my number one, no questions asked. Wow. wow. I knew it had a shot. I knew I was potentially going to feel shame because it's one I haven't caught up with. I didn't know you were going to put it at number one. Just... Yeah, really it's digging there. at me it's there, there, Josh. But it, it's a okay. no. It's a commitment to you know, and you got to watch it. It's a body, like I've described before. It's a body rhythm movie. Don't squeeze this in. Don't chop it up in parts. You know, give it the space it needs, the time, which is hard to find these days, right? For anyone. So yeah, if you're going to do it, do it that way. And and yeah, I I don't think even if you don't love it as much as I did, I don't think you'll come away like disappointed or feel like your time was wasted. Well, I'm not going to shame you with my number one film of the year so far. In fact, you might just applaud because it's your number two. I've got The People's Joker Love at it. number one. Whoa. A movie so undaunted. I'm talking about big swings. It was set to premiere at TIFF, and I know you covered some of this ground, Josh, but it was set to premiere at TIFF in September 2022 before the director, Vera Drew, had to pull it due to rights issues. The poster calls it a fair use film by Vera Drew because it portrays these characters from the Batman universe that DC and Warner Brothers didn't sign off on. And I'm actually going to read you a little bit from Katie Reif writing for IndieWire about the movie. She might be, this is Drew, in her own words, irony poison, but she's fluent in Batman comics. Alan Moore's 1988 graphic novel, The Killing Joke, is especially relevant to Drew's version of Joker's origin story. She makes impassioned arguments in favor of Todd Phillips' Joker. Seeing Batman forever in the cinema was a formative experience in her life. Her film has deep cut references to minor Batman villains. And here's how deep it is. I had to look this up, and even after looking it up, I'm probably going to get it wrong. Mr. Mixius Pitalik? Okay, someone's going to write in and say they I, I you are, are never listening to the show again. <laughs> Imagined here as a fairy godmother type who allows Drew's Joker to come to terms with her childhood. With The People's Joker, director Vera Drew is doing the exact thing that studios have been asking superhero fans to do for years. She's telling her life story through the medium of Batman characters, identifying with these characters and intertwining them with the deepest, most vulnerable parts of herself. In Drew's film, becoming a woman has the same freeing effect as becoming the Joker has on Arthur Fleck. She's less antisocial about it, however, and in some ways, here is a film less cynical than Phillips. She's making IP personal. So it's at number one for me because... It's that vulnerability, the humor. And I would say, with all due respect to Katie, it's not just less cynical, it's far less cynical than Philip's film, despite the fact that Drew very pointedly takes aim at several different targets. And it's that fluency, <laughs> fluency that obviously I personally don't have, but really appreciate because I think the satire is so much more potent because it's clear that Drew cares enough to criticize. I got this email from Jeremy in Iowa City who said, I saw The People's Joker last night and just listened to your review this morning. I realized listing the best moments would either spoil everything or take the entire episode, but the level of care Drew and Co. used to throw in a constant pile of under-the-radar Easter eggs for the Batman nerds is one of my favorite parts. The animation throwing back to The Dark Knight Returns during Mr. J's old life in particular killed me. Thanks for covering something so unbelievably weird and dare I say punk rock. So I didn't get any of those Easter eggs watching the film, but that's the the level you can appreciate this movie on, or you can watch it like Jeremy did because of how fluent Drew is and get all of those references. Mm. And you talked, Josh, about how it was crowdsourced during the pandemic. Over 100 different artists collaborated virtually with Drew, made up of all this mixed media, and I hope more people get to see it here as we do put it in the running. We have put it in the running for the golden brick at the end of the year. And you beat me to this as well, Josh, a final note that we have details about the screening in spring green, Wisconsin. It's just about an hour away. I think from Madison, Sam pulling this together. If you go to the people's joker.com, you'll actually see the details there under screenings, or you'll find a link in the show notes for this episode over at filmspotting.net pile Jeremy said pile, right? That's such a perfect word. And it's, it might have a negative connotation, but it's not, it's the, it's the levels of creativity. I think that's mm -hmm. like hodgepodge I said too. And I don't mean that to be a pejorative thing either. It's, it's just the density of the ideas and, and visual brilliance of this movie is, is overwhelming. 
God, I can't wait to see it. I can't wait to see both of your guys' number ones. I have just not- Just drive oh. to Spring Green. No, I was- There you go. Just Spring Green, was Wisconsin. Seriously, if I was free little, this weekend, weekend, I would trip. go. I would go. <laughs> I would go. Those are our top five films of 2024 so far. Now, we've heard some honorable mentions along the way. Any additional titles either of you would like to throw into the mix that haven't come up yet? You got anything, Michael? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I got a few things. You had 12, so yeah, you've got some I know. titles thanks to list. For, thanks for this frustration. I really I love it. Uh, how I, <laughs> I, you know, I, number My number six, I just missed it. Uh, how to Have Sex, a uh, fantastic debut film, and, and a really clear-eyed portrait of, you know, sort of female coming of age and, you know, a, a spring break trip to Crete from England that is, it's just, I, I don't know, that one really hit me almost about about the hardest of anything I've seen this year. I don't, I'm not quite sure why I didn't make the top five. That's just how frustrating this thing is. But I really like, you know, Hitman, as I mentioned. Uh, I really still wrestle with the ethical implications of this film, Gasoline Rainbow. Did you see that? Mm. If you yeah, see, I did. What What are the what are the well, concerns? this idea? It's I'm curious, I, and I like that film a great deal. But I, this idea, the, the sort of like long road trip among these sort of uh, high school group from uh, far east Oregon, rural Oregon, going to see the ocean for the first time, and it's, it's shot like a documentary. And these it plays a little bit of peekaboo about like what what is the truth? Is this a made up documentary? Is it uh, mm. are these in fact just non actors who are playing versions of themselves? In sort of improv settings, all this, it I, I I didn't find it cheap or specious, I guess, in the things, but I, I I still wrestle with like ah, you know, is this how legitimate is is the effect of it on me? Mm. I found it compelling every minute, and uh, I yeah. I was just I don't know, I need to revisit that even to get the ethical questions clear. But I really like that a lot, and uh, yeah, I mean that's that's about. It. Yeah. Well, that, that what is it question is is kind of, and I've only seen Gasoline Rainbow and Bloody Nose Empty Pockets, but based on those two films, you know, the brothers who made both Bill and Turner Ross, it kind of seems to be their their thing in those two movies. It's like, is this a documentary? Right. Right. Is this is this fiction? Are are these performers or are they documentary subjects? So so yeah, it, it's kind of in this in this gray area for sure. All right, so I have uh, a couple. Really, if I look at my tentative top ten right now of the of the nine, I've got nine in contention. We've mentioned both of most of them. We've mentioned most of them except for a good one, which is not coming out till August, I think. But this is another debut by India Donaldson about a seventeen year old uh, girl who's going on a camping trip with her father and his good friend. So look for that in August. It's incredible. Mm. Really enjoyed that. And then the only other one I think I would mention looking at my list is, yeah, the um, Frida documentary I talked about uh, a couple months ago uh, on this show, but uh, uh, on Frida Kahlo that inventively uses not only animate some of her work, but but uses her writings and diary entries and gives another great vocal, you got to call it a performance, even though this is a documentary, to bring those to life. Definitely compelling, and right now, as of June, on my top ten list. A couple honorable mentions for me. I saw the TV Glow already came up, and Janet Planet as well, which we recommended a bit earlier in the show. A movie I recommended a few weeks ago here on the show is Ghost Light, the movie set here in the Chicago suburbs about a construction worker who gets involved in a theater production of Romeo and Juliet. Really good, really moving film. I also would love, we don't have time here, and even if you guys have seen it, but maybe we can make time and especially get into spoilers. I'd love to talk about Late Night with the Devil, starring David Desmalchin as the the TV host who decides to bring perhaps a woman who is possessed by the devil onto his late night TV show and introduce her to the world. That is another film that takes some really big, bold swings. And maybe they don't all pay off, and that happens sometimes with movies that do that. And then one other mention for a Linklater film, one I hadn't even heard of until I put something out on Twitter and a listener responded. Cole Weinstein said, technically part of a three-part doc TV series, but Richard Linklater's Hometown Prison is an 87-minute doc about his hometown and probably the best film I've seen all year. It's on Max. And so I did watch Hometown Prison. It's it's interesting because it's all about Huntsville, Texas. And throughout the film, we see some of the places that 
Linklater grew up, we see some of the places where he shot scenes or scenes from his real life occurred that inspired scenes from his movies. But it's really a reckoning with growing up in a town that has seven prisons and where all these people are executed. And it's the same prison system that the Steve James documentary at the death house door deals with. And there's a little bit of overlap of characters, if you will, between those two films. And it's, it's a link later documentary and that it's very much about the death penalty and it's about the, the morality of it, but it's also kind of link later. So it's a meditation on time where he's looking back at himself and who he was when he was in high school and just out of college. And it's all about these people who have been on these journeys with the death penalty, having grown up in that town or been part of that prison system. Some of his old friends are people who are prison guards who are there for eight, 10, 12 hours with some of these men in their cells before they're taken to their final moments. Mm. It is an interesting film. I've only seen that part of the three-part doc, The Hometown Prison, but it's the same scenario where it's set in Texas and they take two other filmmakers and they ask them to make personal stories about some of these larger, thornier topics uh, about their hometowns. So that's Hometown Prison, available on Max. Again, those are our top five films of the year so far. You can view our lists over at filmspotting.net. Just click on lists, and that is our show. You can also connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, or Letterboxd. Adam is at Film Spotting. I'm at Larson on Film. Over at filmspotting.net, you can vote in the current film spotting poll. We're asking you to name your favorite Yorgos Lanthimos movie. For show t-shirts or other merch, go to filmspotting.net slash shop. Our show is listener supported. You can join the Film Spotting family at filmspottingfamily.com. For as little as five bucks a month, you can listen to the show early and ad free. You'll also get a weekly newsletter, monthly bonus shows, and access to the entire Film Spotting archive. In that archive, full reviews of many of the films you've heard us mention this week. Again, filmspottingfamily.com. Streaming out now, The Devil's Bath. This is the latest from the directors of 2019's The Lodge and 2014's Goodnight Mommy. That's on Shudder. A Family Affair stars Nicole Kidman and Zac Efron. They hook up in the new Netflix comedy that also stars Joey King and Kathy Bates. I know, Josh, we're both curious about this one. Michael, I don't know if you've had a chance to see it already, but Fancy Dance starring Lily Gladstone is out. That's a road trip drama from director Erica Tremblay. That's on Apple TV+. Plus. We might actually cover that. At least I'll give it a nod on on next week's show, Adam, with Roxana Haddadi, because we'll be able to see it by then. I know she's interested. I saw it at the Athena Film Festival earlier this year. It's quite good. Very interesting in the context of Killers of the Flower Moon, I'll say, beyond Mm -hmm. Lily Gladstone being in both. So, yeah, maybe we'll touch on that on next week's show. In limited release, you can see Daddy-O starring Dakota Johnson as a woman who shares a cab and a conversation with Sean Penn. Out wide, Kevin Costner's Horizon, an American Saga, part one of 30. My notes <laughs> tell me. A quiet it just, place. It just keeps growing. Like, uh-huh. it, it was shocking to me that this wasn't one film, and now it's 30? Wow. That's right. A Quiet Place Day One is also out. And Josh, next week with Roxana, you'll talk about A Quiet Place Day One. You also are going to share your top five prequels. I look forward to that. Ooh. Yeah. I mean, you know, Fancy Dance too. It's because Roxana, we meant to have her, I think we tried to have her on during a pandemic show and as happened with so many people, illness hit, it Ooh. didn't happen. So so now we're I'm going to make the most of finally getting Roxana Haddadi on the show. We're going we're going to do a top 5, we're going to do a Quiet Place review and then yeah, hopefully talk about Fancy Dance as well. Film Spotting is produced by Golden Joe Dasso and Sam Van Hogren. Without Sam and Golden Joe, this show wouldn't go. Our production assistant is Veronica Phillips. Special thanks to everyone at WBEZ Chicago. More information is available at wbez.org and special special thanks to you. Michael Phillips. How, how's the Chicago Tribune website operating these days? I always love the updates. <laughs> good. It's, you uh, always pull out the, 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 I was the, actually the, on the thesaurus. I was on the phone with a, 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 a friend of mine I hadn't talked to in years, and he says, you know, I tried to read that review of, you know, whatever it was, Tuesday or something, and it's, I just, it just didn't want my dollar. 
you know, it's a dollar for six months. <laughs> it's like we couldn't quite figure it. And I, I wouldn't got on, take it. I got on the phone. I did it. I, I, but I said, let's do it together. Figured, well, an hour and a half later, we figured it out. <laughs> And then an oh hour and, and, and within one minute after that, he was asked to sign in again as if it had never, they had never met, you know, this new subscriber. So uh, it's going See, fine. It's going fine. Thanks, Jeff. It's, it's going fine. This is always, this is always PTSD for me for, for my last newspaper days, circa 09, 2010, <laughs> when I hate to say the same things were happening. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, it was fun. Thank Th you, Michael. Thank you. I appreciate it. No, it was, it was a good, uh, 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 enjoyably frustrating, you know, exercise. And uh, I, I, I'm yes. going to recant a lot of these come December. <laughs> That's fine. Wait. It's always good to have you, Michael. For Film Spotting, I'm Josh Larson. And I'm Adam Kempinar. Thanks for listening. This conversation can serve no purpose anymore. Goodbye. Film Spotting is listener supported. Join the Film Spotting family at filmspottingfamily.com and get access to ad free episodes, monthly bonus shows, our weekly newsletter, and for the first time, all in one place, the entire Film Spotting archive going back to 2005. That's at filmspottingfamily.com.